Part C, questions 31 to 42. In this part of the test, you'll hear two different extracts. In each extract, you'll hear health professionals talking about aspects of their work. For questions 31 to 42, choose the answer A, B or C, which fits best according to what you hear. Now look at extract 1. You hear an interview with an optometrist called Henry Chapman who's talking about the impact of macular degeneration. You now have 90 seconds to read the questions. We are talking today with Henry Chapman, an optometrist with a special interest in macular degeneration. Mr. Chapman, firstly, what is macular degeneration and how did your particular interest in this disease come about? Macular degeneration is actually the name given to a group of chronic degenerative retinal eye diseases that cause a distortion or progressive loss of a person's central vision but leaves the peripheral or side vision intact. Say, if someone with macular degeneration was facing me now, they'd see my arms and legs, the area around me, but my, my face would likely be obscured by a dark or empty space. They experience a dreadful sense of being disconnected or cut off from everyday life. As an optometrist for 30 years, I've had my share of cases and every new patient is like a spark because the impact of each accumulates over time to a kind of, oh, almost what you call a fixation, I guess. Even after all these years, however, I was still shocked to hear my sister had recently been diagnosed with macular degeneration, and because of that, I've now also seen firsthand what this terrible disease does to the entire family. What's the most challenging part for those living with macular degeneration? Take a recent patient of mine called Robert. He was 55 when he first noticed the symptoms. Blurred vision, distortion of straight lines. The effect on his life was profound, and that's the tragedy of this disease. He was working as a driving instructor, then suddenly had to resign, but still with the financial burdens of daily life. His passion for carpentry, or even basic reading, fell by the wayside. Worst of all for Robert was no longer being able to see his grandchildren's faces clearly, which was obviously very upsetting. Unfortunately, he also experienced depression for a time. This may not happen to everyone, but it's certainly more common than people realise. What can be done for patients such as Robert? This is a disease that's typically related to ageing, which is the commonest risk factor, but it's certainly not a normal or inevitable consequence of getting old. So although older people are generally more accepting of the extra baggage that comes with ageing, it's still difficult for many to accept and discuss the changes associated with macular degeneration. There's a tragedy attached to any disease or illness, but vision loss also carries some major disruptions to a person's lifestyle, as well as mental hurdles, like few other diseases do. I feel that's something that can at times be neglected. There are support groups, but I'm talking on an optometrist level. My job is to help diagnose and treat a patient. But what of their additional struggles? That's where I'd like to place myself a little better and allow patients like Robert the freedom and availability to open up. 
And do patients ever volunteer to express their fears or frustrations to you directly? They do, but in the beginning, what I see is their brave face. They often say, "There's always someone worse off," and that's an admirable trait. But reality soon rears its ugly head, because macular degeneration doesn't result in total blindness. Sufferers are left with partial vision, and I suspect that many patients may genuinely interpret this as being somehow less significant than total blindness, like they don't have the right to speak out. The reality is, of course, that sufferers of macular degeneration have many of the same fears and impediments as those who've completely lost their sight, and yet they're worried about voicing this. So it's imperative that we not only actively listen, but also encourage and support them to openly share their stories. Can you give us an example of how you've changed the way you treat your own patients? Sure. I have a patient called Jennifer. She's 62 and has late-stage neovascular or wet macular degeneration. This is caused by the formation of very fragile blood vessels, which leak fluid and blood within and under the retina. It also leads to a rapid loss of central vision, as opposed to the dry kind, which is a far slower decline. Therefore, it came as a great shock for Jennifer. In turn, making her a perfect prototype, if you will, in trying something new. I allocated just an additional ten minutes to each of her appointments and explained it was for an open discussion. This extra time gave me the opportunity to delve a little deeper into how she was coping with the rapid changes she was experiencing and gave her more freedom to discuss her concerns. The positive change in communication was extraordinary, so I adopted this for all my patients thereafter. So what, if anything, can be done to help prevent macular degeneration? Research is ongoing, and advancements in treatment are being made daily, and this needs to continue. But you can't leave it up to researchers. I believe in what the individual can do. This means that any difficulty with vision should never be dismissed as part of aging. In its early stages, macular degeneration may not result in noticeable visual symptoms, but it can be detected with an eye test. If people want to save their sight, I can't stress enough how crucial the early detection of any form of macular degeneration is. The sooner that this disease is detected, the earlier that steps can be taken to help slow its progression and save sight through treatment and necessary lifestyle modifications. Thank you for sharing. You hear a clinical dietitian called Rebecca Hudson giving a presentation to a group of healthcare providers. You now have ninety seconds to read the questions. My name is Rebecca Hudson, and I'm a clinical dietitian working here in the hospital. Today, I'll be presenting what some consider a very challenging topic: raising the issue of weight loss and obesity with patients. A person's weight is a complex and sensitive issue. Many factors are at play, like concerns about being judged, feelings of embarrassment, or even failure. As a dietitian, I see this on a daily basis. Yet, beginning discussions about weight can still be unsettling for both myself and the patient. Who often knows it's coming? This is because, as healthcare providers, we're sometimes uncertain of how to discuss weight-related issues while still providing support to our patients in ways that are empowering and non-judgmental. 
During the consultation, we strive to get our message across, but if we lack the initial training to do so, chances are we'll lose trust and irrevocably damage the provider-patient relationship that's so vital. We risk stigmatizing or even shaming our patients to the detriment of treatment goals and inevitably patient outcomes. So how is effective communication achieved for sensitive matters? Often a healthcare provider's comments as they open the channels of dialogue with the patient are the most important. A patient's level of comfort in discussing their weight needs to be established. Asking directly if they're okay talking about their general health and weight is the most efficient way to do this. Once the conversation is moving, I've personally found that tactfully choosing terms like excess body weight or above ideal body weight far easier on the ear than excess fat or obese. This practice is very important in establishing trust. One method I've found very useful during this time is not referring to them as the condition. It's common these days to hear that a patient has diabetes rather than is diabetic. This crosses over to has obesity rather than is obese. The next step in maintaining dialogue with the patient is by way of open-ended questions and ensuring we articulate them the way they're intended. This is achieved by first eradicating all implicit assumptions and bias about obesity to ensure that we don't give patients a feeling of being judged. Let me give you an example. The basic questions used by dietitians are based upon three of the main factors that influence a person's weight, their eating, drinking, and exercise patterns, as well as their previous attempts at weight loss. If I say, I think you need to lose weight, this is my opinion, a judgment. Now, consider an alternative like, are you interested in losing some weight? This suggests that you're likely sympathetic to any past attempts, that you're willing to provide them with support across the board, and it allows the patient to begin the conversation without feeling judged or criticized. There are, of course, occasions when consultations don't go as planned, even after your support has been well established. I'm a strong believer, as are many of my colleagues, in relating a patient's weight to their current medical condition, whether it's diabetes, heart disease, osteoarthritis of the knee, or disease of the eye. Regardless of the condition, the general health of the patient is paramount. This is a technique that, when employed with tact, will prove a very persuasive one, as often obesity is considered a separate issue. So, when it's seen as a contributing factor, and therefore one that, if brought under control, may reduce symptoms such as chronic pain, the effort needed to make the change soon appears less significant. Education and ongoing support for the patient will reinforce a healthcare provider's advice and recommendations. This can be as simple as providing patient fact sheets and brochures about their current condition, as well as the benefits of weight management. My personal recommendation is to carefully select two or three measurable, achievable goals and discuss the steps necessary to reach them. This is also a valuable time for the healthcare provider to evaluate the patient's readiness to make the necessary lifestyle changes to lose weight as well as the extent of familial support, the latter often being a key element of success. All that I've mentioned here today are examples of what dietitians refer to as motivational interviewing. This is an open-ended way of interacting, built around helping patients go from being disinterested in or against a behavior change to taking steps toward being willing to make some changes. It is an open-ended approach to trying to learn where the patient is coming from and what they want and helping them lead the way towards positive behavioral changes. It starts with trying to get the patient to open up about their feelings rather than assuming we know who they are and then together coming up with a set of initial steps they can take. We need to engage the patient and then the patient activates the behavior change.